as you're finding out, please go ahead and share your slides, Harry. Uh, today we're going to have three uh, three one hour presentations from uh, from some graduate students, so we get to see some some new people and start to learn about what they're working on. Uh, same rules as we've been doing. If you have a question, just uh, unmute yourself and uh, and break in and, and interrupt. Uh, slides to uh, Armin, link to Armin's slides are up there. I'll set, put a link to Harry's slides in a moment. So if you want to follow along. Uh, also, I just want to mention that this is joint with, uh, this seminar is joint with the Philadelphia Fed. Uh, you can see Rock back there uh, with the, he's on a ship right now uh, at sea. Uh, this is, uh, this is kind of joint with them. Typically we have the fall, uh, the fall uh, trade workshop that obviously we can't do in person. So we decided to, uh, to do something different. Uh, okay, I've talked too much. Harry, take it away. All right, let's get started. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to my uh, talk. Uh, my name is Hai Shi Li. You can call me um, Harry. I'm from the University of Chicago, and I'm on the draw market. So my draw market paper studies multinational production and global shock propagation in the context of the Great uh, Recession. So during the Great Recession, both world uh, international trade and multinational production, or MP, collapsed. Uh, to be specific, from 2008 to 2009, world aggregate trade and world aggregate foreign athlete sales fell by 12% and 11% relative to world GDP. Meanwhile, world GDP fell by about 2%. So there's a vast literature on the international trade collapse during the Great Recession. However, works on the multinational collapse are um, limited. As one, of the first, as, as one of the few papers that study the MP collapse during the Great Recession, and one of the first to study the cross-border propagation of shocks through both trade and MP, and I aim at answering the following questions. First, what fundamentals explained the trade and MP collapse? And second, how did the fundamentals impact the cross-country differences in real wage changes? The key challenge to these questions lie in the close interactions between trade and multinational production. 40% of world international trade has multinational foreign athletes on at least one side of the transactions. Uh, these trade by uh, foreign athletes shows up in the aggregate statistics of both trade and MP. Therefore, a collapse in trade may naturally imply a collapse in foreign athlete sales. Uh, on the other hand, negative shocks to foreign athletes may lead to declines uh, in uh, trade um, as well. So um, to uh, tackle these uh, challenges, I propose a quantitative framework modeling shocks affecting final expenditure shares, productivity, cost of international trade, and multinational production. The key novelties of the model are multinationals' heterogeneous uh, sourcing and selling frictions with uh, non headquarter countries. So these frictions reflect the additional barriers faced by multinationals to source and to sell with the markets that they are not familiar with. And these parameters um, introduce the rich interactions between trade and MP. Uh, the intuition goes as the following. Um, the sourcing friction matches the model to the fact in the data that foreign athletes import more than local producers. If trade barrier increases, foreign athletes are more exposed to this foreign shock and they decline more in their sales share in the host economy, okay? And the selling friction, on the other hand, matches the model to the fact that foreign athletes export more than local producers. If foreign athletes' productivity declines relative to local producers, the host country's total export would decline more relative to uh, domestic sales. So I, um, you know, to, to, to study the performance of trade and multinational production in the Great Recession, I invert the model on a recently released OECD analytical activities of multinationals database to exactly back out the model shocks and to perform uh, counterfactuals. In particular, I focus on the roles of shocks that are specific to multinationals. They're just the variables colored, in, uh, colored red on this page. There are changes in foreign athletes productivity relative to local producers, as well as changes in multinationals uh, sourcing and selling frictions with non high color countries. Um, so before I report the paper's findings to avoid confusion throughout the paper, I refer to a country's total trade as the average of its export and import. 
This is consistent with the definitions in the trade collapse uh, literature. Correspondingly, I define country's total MP as the average of its inward and outward foreign athlete sales. So this paper has a couple of findings. First, I find that ME specific shocks explain as high as 71% of cross-country variation of total MP changes uh, relative to uh, GDP, among which those that hit the top five headquarters of outward MP, they are the United States, Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, and France, as of 2008, explain 41% of the same. Multinational specific shocks contribute to the trade declines as well. They explain 19% uh, of cross-country variation in total trade changes relative to GDP. Within country shocks, um, they, are, they are the shocks that happen within a country. And in my model, a shocks to sectoral final demand, local producers' productivity, et cetera, explain a large, explain a large share, 40% of the same. And this is consistent with the findings in the trade collapse uh, literature that the trade collapse is mostly uh, within, within countries. However, I find that unlike the uh, ME specific shocks, within country shocks do not propagate as strongly across borders. Um, within country shocks to the top five exporters just explain 0.3% of cross country variation in total trade changes relative to GDP. So the intuition is, is the following. Um, countries do not supply a large amount of outward MP. For example, China and India may receive large amounts of inward MP from the important global headquarters. Therefore, they are subject to the shocks hitting these important headquarters as well. However, for trade, on the other hand, uh, because trade has to balance more or less, the countries that do not export a lot may not import a lot either. Therefore, they are less subject to the vizine country shocks hitting the important um, exporters, okay? And I also find that for welfare, uh, I mean specific shocks, in particular those hit the important headquarters, explain a significant share of cross-country variation in real wage changes. Um, and I conclude this missing the MP margin would uh, likely misallocate the impact of uh, I mean specific shocks to local shocks and lead to incorrect conclusions about the sources of a country's real wage or welfare uh, changes. Okay. So this paper builds on a couple of strands of literature. It contributes to the literature on multinational production by introducing both the heterogeneous sourcing and selling frictions of, uh, of multinationals uh, with non headquarter countries. Missing either friction will fail to match to the data, the fact that foreign athletes engage more in importing and exporting than um, local producers. The paper also builds on the literature that studies the propagation of shocks across sectors and countries. Uh, my paper contributes a, con a trackable framework that studies shock propagation with trade, MEs, and input output linkages. Uh, the paper also builds on the literature on the great trade collapse and the performance of um, MEs during the Great Recession. I study the interactions between these uh, two channels and study how shocks to important headquarters, host countries, and important exporters and importers propagate to the rest of the world uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Great Recession. Okay, so my main data source is the recently released OECD Analytical Activities of Multinationals Database. Uh, the database consists of two uh, data tables. The first data table covers the uh, headquarter host country specific uh, multinational bilateral gross output for 59 countries plus the rest of the world for 34 sectors. Uh, the second data table splits uh, bilateral trade for the same set of countries and sectors by uh, whether the buyer and the seller is local producers or foreign athletes. A caveat is that we do not know uh, from the database, the exact headquarter of the buyer and seller, if they are, you know, foreign athletes. I, I will talk about. I will talk later about the method I use to back out the trade by foreign athletes of a specific uh, headquarter, and I get the origin, destination, specific bilateral variables, for example, distance, common language, etc., from the gravity database, and in the end, I get population and real GDP data from uh, United Nations. 
So um, this is, um, you know, like this is almost the end of the introduction. So uh, feel free to let me know if there are any questions. I'm 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 not very good at like uh, you know looking at the chat box to you know to to respond to the questions uh, along my talk. So uh, feel free to interrupt and let me know if there are questions. Thanks. So Harry, I have a question. I don't question know. At all. Hi, hi everybody. It's great to see everybody. Um, so in the multinational output data, you do you see where that output goes? Um, so, I mean, that, that was, that was the caveat I mentioned uh, earlier. So like what, what OECD data does essentially is to split the, uh, the, in the, uh, you know, the, um, you know, like the inter-country input output data, by whether or not the headquarter, uh, sorry, but whether or not the buyer and seller is foreign athletes or local producers. So we okay, know okay, okay. the I aggregate, that, uh, sorry, like the, uh, we know the aggregate sales by foreign athletes, for example, in China to the United States. But from that data alone, we don't know uh, the, uh, the sales by you know, Japanese enterprise in China to the United States. So, so I, I just was um, upfront. I wasn't quite sure why I would think that multinationals should um, respond differently to the shock, um, which is the Great Recession. Can, can you help me? I mean, in, in some sense, like we, you know, some people have made a big deal out of like, this is a financial shock. And so if firms have easy access to credit, they should um, have less of an effect. I, I just, I kind of don't, um, if firms are more intensive in particular industries, they should be more exposed. But what is it, spe what's special about the multinational that's um, gonna lead to like a different response? Is it just because they're big or, yeah. So like, I, I would say they, they are hit by a different set of shocks from uh, domestic, uh, to domestic or local producers. And um, there, there's the trans transmission mechanism from the headquarter to, to host country. And I, I think this is something new. And on top of that, I also show that multinationals are more subject to, you know, like trade shocks and, you know, like those like sector composition shocks than local producers because they are more exposed. That's the, that's the, that's the second channel I'm, I'm exploring. I admit that it, with more granular data on like firm level, you know, multinational like uh, production and international trade, we may uh, investigate the specific, like for example, financial linkages, that kind of thing. And this might be, uh, you know, my next step is, is, in, the, is, is, in, is in the agenda. It, it might be hard to explore like what, what are the roles of financial linkages or the microeconomic channels with these aggregate database. Okay. Thanks. So uh, the rest of the talk uh, proceeds uh, in the following steps. First, you know, I discuss a few multinational production facts in the cross section and during the Great Recession real quick. And next, I introduce a new model of uh, MP trade and input output linkages. And I estimate the trade and multinational um, elasticities. And then I discuss the procedure to exactly back out the model shocks. And finally, I run counterfactuals and show um, the uh, results. So a first look at the OECD data gives the following facts, which motivate uh, specific parts of the model. First, I find that foreign athletes account for larger shares in the gross output of the durable manufacturing sector than non-durable manufacturing and non-manufacturing uh, um, um, sectors. Um, therefore, the sector composition effect may contribute to the collapse in multinationals in a way similar to the trade collapse. And this motivates me to introduce multiple sectors or sector heterogeneity into the model. I also find that foreign athletes account for significantly larger share in the host economy's import and export than their shares in gross output. To explain this, I introduce a multinational uh, specific sourcing and selling frictions with non-hackholder country. A caveat though from the results um, derived from these aggregate statistics is that um, you know, uh, uh, an average foreign athlete may differ from an average local producers in many ways besides uh, the foreign athlete status. Additionally, the exact headquarter country may affect where the foreign athlete source from and sell to um, as well. So to handle these problems, I complement the analysis with, uh, with the Chinese firm level data and follow the strategy of Wang 2019 to confirm uh, these uh, channels. So that paper finds 
conditional or observed firm characteristics, foreign athletes are more likely to export and export more, and in particular back to their headquarters and the countries that are close uh, to their uh, headquarters. So in, in, uh, I established two mirror facts for importing. I find that conditional on firm employment, capital, intermediate input, and PFP, foreign athletes are more likely to import and import more, and particularly from their headquarters and the countries close to their headquarters. So with both evidence, um, these analysis confirm that on top of the Euro international trade costs, multinationals face additional barriers sourcing from and selling to uh, non headquarter uh, countries. So for the collapse in multinational production of foreign athlete sales in the Great Recession, here I plot the MP collapse in terms of um, you know, countries' uh, changes in the ratio of total MP to GDP against the trade collapse in terms of changes in total trade, um, in trade changes in the ratio of total trade uh, relative to uh, GDP. The MP and trade collapse in terms of total MP and total trade are positively uh, correlated. Trade by foreign athletes may drive the positive correlation because it shows up in both the aggregate statistics of total trade and total MP. And this also suggests that shocks to uh, foreign athletes, for example, to foreign athletes productivity relative to local producers may contribute to the decline in trade as well. On the other hand, shocks to trade uh, may contribute to the decline in MP. And we, I will quantitatively evaluate these hypotheses in, you know, in later um, sections. Um, it's also straightforward from the figure that while the trade collapse is global, um, every country has a decline in trade relative to GDP, the MP collapse is actually more heterogeneous. It's restricted to a smaller set of uh, countries. Uh, the trade collapse literature finds that the global decline in trade is mainly caused by a decline in demand for durable manufacturing sector, which is possibly related to the decline in the investment efficiency or like, you know, like a, a short of uh, trade credit associated with the financial crisis. Uh, similar to trade, MP is also more intensive as I showed in the durable manufacturing sector. Therefore, the sector final demand shocks are unlikely uh, the main drivers for the MP collapse. Otherwise, the MP class would have been common across countries, just like the decline in uh, trade. Okay. So without further ado, let's move to the, to the model. Um, the global economy consists of M countries and capital S sectors. Any country M or headquarters technology is producing in any host country M um, of the world. In the case that M's technology is producing in M, it is called local producers. Otherwise, if a country's technology is produced in another, in another country, it's called uh, foreign athletes. So agents in this economy are workers and producers or multinationals. And input to production are labor and composite, in, uh, composite goods from all sectors. And following the trade collapse literature and the, mar the papers that study shock propagation with MNEs, I assume all markets here are competitive. Um, there are two types of goods in the economy, the tradable output in blue and the non-tradable composite goods in red. The composite goods are used as both um, input and consumption goods. Uh, MNEs produce um, tradable output with constant return to scale called Douglas technology. Uh, in the subscript, flows are from uh, right uh, to left and MNEs are defined by uh, headquarters. Uh, there is headquarter M, host country N, sector S. And capital A denotes uh, the multinational's TFP. And in the case that the multinational headquarter is the same as the production location, A is called the local uh, productivity. And capital L denotes labor. Uh, due to data limitation, I assume all multinationals producing in the same host economy N face the same wage, uh, WN. And capital M denotes the quantity of sector S primes composite goods used as input to produce sector S um, output. So overall, multinationals in the same host economy N differ with respect to their TFP, as well as the uh, multinational specific composite goods price P that they face. Okay. So composite hey, Ari, goods. Sorry. sorry. sorry I, I, um, yeah. You probably knew this question was coming. So, um, so 
again, in, the, in COVID, we've seen like that uh, production fell a lot more than sales. Um, and we know that most of the, um, most of what picks that up is inventory adjustments. Um, so how do I want to think about like your framework? I know doesn't have that. Um, is there something about like the time frame that you're looking at because you're looking at, you're looking at annual data that you don't have to, you don't think you have to worry about it or is it, is it going to bias your results in a particular way by not having that mechanism? Yeah, definitely. This is a, uh... This is a, a good point, and uh, um, I, I'm sorry. Right now, my model does not have this mechanism, although it's it's definitely worth exploring. Um, thanks, thanks. Um, it's it's a good point, and and like, um, so uh, if I may uh, move forward, the composite goods consists of the tribal output that MNE source from all countries and all multinationals. I assume the composite goods are this is the glitch fashion. A massive CS aggregate of tribal output from all countries and producers. The outer NAS is taken over all host country J's and the inner NAS is taken over all headquarters or multinational I's. So consider, you know, like the following example of uh, Ford, um, uh, Ford Canada to source, um, you know, like our audio system that they put on their cars. So in the first step, they look at the important production platforms um, of the world, for example, China, India, uh, et cetera. And given the selection of the platform, they survey the list of the audios uh, produced there. In the end, they may decide to source uh, Samsung, a Korean brand audio from China. In, in, in the paper, in the draft, I also show that a multivariate free shade distribution uh, uh, preferences that mimic the, this decision process could rationalize the same um, you know, nesting uh, structure. I use sigma s to denote the sector specific tree elasticity and zeta s to denote the sector specific MNE uh, elasticity. I use the small q to denote the quantity of tradable output from uh, Samsung China to Ford uh, Canada. Okay, and uh, the order of the nest help me match, helps me match my model to the data um, exactly. So here I specify the price faced by the buying multinational for Canada to get the tradable output from Samsung China. So let's start with the seller. The marginal cost of input or the sourcing capability of the seller is Cobb Douglas in beige and the composite goods uh, prices. With competitive market and profit maximization, factory gate price is just the sourcing capability divided by the multinationals uh, TFP. And uh, to do international trade, multinationals face the Euro origin destination specific international trade costs. Uh, it consists of the non-tariff trade barriers, you know, with K, K is iceberg, with the normalization of trading with the home country to one. And, and I use tau to denote the tariff rates and T equals one plus tau. Okay, so multinationals face the headquarter origin specific sourcing frictions with non-headquarter countries, HTO dub. It reflects, for example, the incompatibility between the sourcing multinationals technology and the input from a, uh, from a non headquarter country. It is also aspect with the normalization of sourcing from the headquarter to one. So H2 the, um, in the contest measures the multinationals forward um, verticalness. In the extreme case that the sourcing friction from all non headquarter countries equal infinity, uh, multinationals are only able to source from their headquarters. So examples of this might be like for local distributors for non headquarter countries, which exclusively source car supplies from the United States. Uh, from the perspective of the headquarter, the distributor is in the downstream, so it reflects uh, forward verticalness. Um, and MNEs, um, you know, also face um, headquarter destination specific selling frictions to non headquarter countries, big H tilde. It is also expert um, with the selling friction back to the headquarter normalized to one. It reflects, for example, the additional marketing cost to the market that the seller is not familiar with. Um, um, you know, it's iceberg, you know, as well. And um, a big HTOTA measures multinationals backward verticalness. In the extreme case, that the selling friction to all not have how to sorry, the, uh, the selling frictions to all non headquarter countries uh, equal, um, sorry, equal uh, infinity, uh, multinationals are only able to sell back 
to their headquarters. Examples might be Samsung's exclusive uh, chips, chip supplier, which exclusively sell to Korea. From the perspective of the headquarter, the supplier is in its upstream, so it reflects backward verticalness. So altogether, the sourcing and selling frictions measure multinational's vertical horizontalness. In the third extreme case, we, I consider all these sourcing and selling frictions equal to one. In this case, foreign athletes have the same patterns of trade as the host economies of local producers. Um, um, uh, in this case, the foreign athletes are horizontal. They may differ from local producers with respect to productivity, but not with respect to their international trade. So in real so life- If I may ask, uh, one second, yes. yes so the multinationals, in your, your theory multinationals uh, in the model, they have more frictions than the local producers? And it's just compensated by the fact that they have higher productivity. Is 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 am I getting this right? Yes, you may you may put it in this way. And and these frictions are necessary to replicate uh, the facts in the data that multinationals trade do international trade in a different way than um, you know local producers. Oh, I I understand I understand that, but it, yeah. in some sense you could try to think of that as having some advantage or having taken advantage of some uh, opportunities, of course, with, with, with frictions, not perfectly. Right. Uh, but in some sense here, there is a, a hard-coded network already in place, and uh, which I think in the medium term makes, uh, makes sense. Mm -hmm. And within that uh, graph of trades that are multinationals, there are some additional frictions. Uh, exactly. Got it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, um, so, yeah, so the cost, um, you know, the, the cost of the cost function and the, and the order of the mass implies two sets of market shares that would be the, that would be critical for my analysis. First, let's look at the multinationals output shares. In my example, they are, they refer to the share of Samsung in China in the total trade output or trade flow from China to Canada. Uh, they are the internet shares of the Nasty CS function, okay? I define multinational selling efficiency by dual relabeling, uh, taking uh, the uh, selling friction, multinational selling friction to the power of one minus the, uh, the multinational uh, elasticity. And this will be the object to be exactly back out uh, from the data following like uh, something like a value accounting approach, which I'll come to in a second. So the share of Samsung China, uh, Samsung China in Chinese trade flows to Canada increases in the selling efficiency in its TFP, but decreases in its cost. Um, the, uh, the producer price index of Chinese goods to Canada is defined with the denominator. Note that this producer price index is origin destination specific, capturing the fact that multinationals hosted in the origin may differ with respect to their ability to sell to different headquarters. Again, coming back to the edge, knife edge cases before, if Samsung is completely inefficient at selling to Canada, it will account for zero share in Chinese um, trade flows to Canada. And if Samsung is equally efficient at selling to any destination, it will account for the same share in Chinese outward, outward, outward trade flow to any destination, as well as Chinese um, domestic, uh, domestic sales. Okay, so I back out the multinationals selling efficiency with the following data from the OECD database. They are the headquarter host country uh, specific multinational gross output, uh, the origin destination specific aggregate trade, as well as local producers output share uh, in um, in uh, origin specific bilateral trade. I have to take this non-trivial approach because uh, the OECD data is not informative about the output shares of arbitrary headquarter country I. Rather, it makes the two-way split between the output shares of uh, local and all foreign producers. Knowing the local producers output share would be sufficient to know um, the share, the upper shares of foreign office. So I only list the uh, local producers upper share um, here. So the procedure takes advantage of the relationship uh, between the multinationals gross output 
and international trade. The gross output for, by multinational from country I in country J equals the host country J's outward sales to all destinations multiplied by I, I's share in, in the trade flow. We don't know the upper shares of arbitrary multinational, so we divide and multiply it with the upper shares of local producers, which is something we know. And if we plug in the formula for upper shares, we get a system of nonlinear equations with data and levels of the multinational selling efficiency as the only unknowns. And the system is M squared dimensional, where M is the number of countries. We solve the system sector by sector, which gives us the levels of multinationals uh, selling uh, efficiencies. Okay, so now let's turn to another set of shares, the multinational sourcing shares. Using the early example, they refer to the expenditure by Ford Canada on the tradable output from China. They are the alternate shares of the nested CS uh, formula. And similarly, I, I define the sourcing efficiency of America and the, uh, American multinationals uh, from China uh, by taking the sourcing friction to the power of one minus the trade uh, elasticity. And this is the ob object to be exactly back out from the data. Uh, the multinationals um, sourcing shares increases in the sourcing efficiency and decreases in the origin destination bilateral trade cost and the producer price um, indexes. And the denominator defines the composite goods price of the sourcing multinational, uh, in, in my example, for uh, Canada. Okay, again, consider the uh, extreme cases. If multinationals from the United States are completely inefficient at sourcing from China, uh, the multinational sourcing shares on China will equal zero. And if all multinationals hosted by Canada are equally good at sourcing from China, all multinationals hosted in Canada will have the same sourcing shares uh, from, from China. And similarly, I back out the sourcing efficiency exactly with the OECD data on the expenditure of multinationals on calculated host country specific composite goods, the composite goods expenditure. Um, and, and the data for the origin destination specific aggregate trade, as well as the sourcing shares of local producers. Um, the uh, procedure takes advantage of the relationship between the international trade and multinational expenditure of composite goods. The trade flow from country J to country N equals the expenditure of all multinationals hosted in country N multiplied by their sourcing shares uh, on the origin country J, right? Adjusted with the tariffs. We don't know the sourcing shares of arbitrary multinationals. So uh, we divide and multiply it with the sourcing share by uh, local producers, which is something we, we know. And if you plug in the equations for the sourcing shares, we get a system of nonlinear equations with data and levels of multinationals sourcing efficiencies as the um, you know, only unknowns. And the system is M squared uh, dimensional and we solve it sector by sector for the levels of the sourcing, um, the sourcing efficiency um, you know, for, for the levels of the multinationals sourcing efficiency, okay? And to close the model, I assume a household utility is CS over sectoral final consumption with delta the elasticity of substitution and alphas, the final demand uh, shifters. And following Caliano at L, I set the final de demand elasticity to four. I assume composite goods used by local producers are also consumed the market clearing condition uh, for labor and composite goods are standard and I'm not going to discuss them here for the sake of time. Um, so I, I, I introduced a new method to estimate the elasticity of substitution for trade and multinational production. First, let's start with country N's local producer sourcing share from J. So variables in green are known variables at this stage, including left hand side variables, the sourcing efficiency, as well as tariffs on the right hand side. And the producer price index is, is not unknown though. However, we may manipulate J's um, you know, local producers output share in the trade flow from uh, J to N uh, to write the producer price index as a function of um, a couple of things include the factory gate price 
at level of its bj, as well as the adjusted apertures um, defined as the apertures divided by the silent efficiency. Uh, both of them are, are known variables, as well as the uh, multinational elasticity. And then I plug in and estimate the equation in logs, and, and I, I get the trade and multinational elasticities. I use the tariff variation to identify the trade elasticity and variations in this adjusted uh, apertures to identify the multinational um, elasticity. The identifying assumptions follow the literature. I make the following um, assumptions. Um, I control for the uh, non-tariff barriers K with the distance, common language, contiguity, and, and trade agreements. I assume tariffs are exogenous to the uncontrolled component in the uh, non-tariff barriers. Okay, and um, the adjusted um, uh, the adjusted aperture C are obviously endogenous, and I instrument them with upstream, downstream, and own sector tariffs imposed in the opposite direction of the trade flow by country J on country country N. The the relevance of the instrument is given by that tariffs shift the cost of origin countries, local producers, and foreign athletes uh, differently because foreign athletes, in particular those uh, headquartered in country N, are more exposed to these tariffs. This leads to variations in, um, in apertures. So here are my estimation results. A couple of findings. First, the trade, elasticity, the trade elasticities are larger than the multinational elasticities for all sectors. This indicates that uh, it's easier to substitute between sourcing origins than to substitute between uh, technologies. Uh, on top of that, I also find that the durable manufacturing sector has larger elasticities than other sectors. This shows that the durable manufacturing sector is more tradable than um, others. Okay. And next, I, you know, I, I back out the non-terror barriers K and multinationals relative productivity uh, to uh, the host countries, local producers with model inversion. I back out the non-tariff uh, barriers um, using approach similar to the construction of high risk index. And I, I write the levels of them as a function of known variables. And with multinational sourcing efficiency and the, multi and the trade elasticity, I manipulate the, uh, the, the sourcing shares by local producers and foreign athletes to get um, you know, foreign athletes composite goods price relative to um, the local producers. And this gives the relative sourcing capability that theta with the Cope Douglas um, assumption. And with the multinational selling efficiency and the multinational uh, and, uh, and, and the MAE elasticity, I manipulate the upper share to get multinationals output, uh, sorry, the multinationals factory gate price relative to uh, local producers. And taking the ratio of the prior two equations, I get multinationals productivity relative to local producers in terms of uh, levels. Uh, with this approach, we get the levels of most frictions uh, we are interested in. And now uh, let's move on to talk about the procedure to back out other frictions in terms of um, changes. Okay. And, and with, regard, with regard to model shocks, I denote a variable with X prime in 2009 if the same variable is denoted with X in 2008. I use X hat um, to denote changes or uh, shocks, okay? And as we know from their, as we already know their levels, shocks to multinational sourcing and selling efficiencies, relative productivity and non-tariff barriers, non-tariff trade barriers are immediately available, okay? Um, I develop a new method to uh, back out the local productivity shocks with uh, country sector level real GDP data and multinational gross output data. Applying the double deflation method for real GDP growth and consistent with the, uh, with the result in Houghton, Bucky and Ferry, uh, et al., um, Bucky and Ferry, et cetera, I find that the real GDP growth for country sector pair is contributed by the productivity growth in all multinationals producing in the country sector pair, as well as the employment uh, growth. Uh, in, in, in that country sector pair. And the weights are the dorma weights, which equal the uh, multinational's gross output divided by the nominal GDP of the country sector pair. 
And if I invert the equation, I get the local productive growth by taking out the contributions by uh, foreign athletes relative, pr relative productive growth to, um, I'm sorry, uh, by, by taking out the contributions of multinationals relative productivity shocks and employment changes from uh, real uh, GDP uh, growth. So to uh, confirm uh, the external validity of my approach, I first show that uh, multinationals relative productivity shocks decline more with the distance between the headquarters and the host countries. However, they decline less with the pre-recession trade and financial investment linkages between the headquarters and the host countries. The latter result is consistent with the findings in Alfaro and Chen. The financial investment linkages um, in, in my regression are measured with the country bilateral portfolio investment data in 2007. And the relations between shocks to MAE sourcing and selling efficiencies and the pre-recession um, bilateral variables between headquarters and origin and destinations have the same sign, but they are in general weaker. I report them in the, in the paper. It is definitely worth exploring uh, the factors that contribute uh, to uh, the shocks of sourcing and selling um, 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 uh, efficiencies as well as the multinationals relative productivity to local producers with more granular, possibly like firm level uh, data as George suggested um, earlier, okay? And consistent with the trade collapse literature, I find that the durable uh, uh, manufacturing sector's final demand shocks decline more um, on average across countries relative to other sectors. Um, this is consistent with the trade collapse literature as, as we, we all know about. And I also find that the durable manufacturing sectors, local productivity shocks do not decline more than uh, the average country, um, so, sorry, for an average country than other sectors. Harry, uh, I have a question. Uh, hi, sure. Uh, this is Rock. Uh, do you have data for other years, less eventful uh, years? I'm curious how uh, your shocks look like in uh, quote unquote, normal years, there will be exactly. obviously some variation every year, right. but the, it first can provide a benchmark to which compare the trade collapse to. And uh, second, it's also a kind of a check on the model as some of those frictions should not be moving a lot year to year. Uh, That's exactly, this is definitely a, a great, great point. Although I haven't had them in the paper, but from my preliminary, uh, exploration, the fact that the ME specific shocks explain a major share of cross country variations in, in terms of total MP relative to uh, GDP only happens during the Great Recession. In other years, multinationals perform in a similar way to international trade. Um, I, I, you know, I, I haven't had the results in the, in the, in the presentation uh, yet, but I, I think this is definitely the way to go. And thanks uh, for making the uh, suggestion uh, for me. Thanks. Oh, okay. And uh, here is a slide of summary. I classify the model shocks into uh, three groups. Um, I will study the impact of individual groups of shocks on the collapse of trade or multinational production. The ME specific shocks consist of the multinationals sourcing shocks, selling shocks, as well as the relative productivity shocks. The trade cost shocks include the shocks to non-tariff barriers and uh, tariffs. The within country shocks are, are, are those that happen within a country. They include the sectoral final demand shocks uh, to uh, final demand shifters, uh, local productivity shocks, trade deficit, as well as um, you know, uh, labor, labor in, in employment. Um, so before we proceed to the main results, I present the measurement and definitions I use that help us understand the results. I build on the literature to measure the cross-country variation in the data that could be explained by a, a specific group of shocks. For example, um, you know, I illustrate this with the MP clefs. Um, let, uh, let log YI hat to denote the log changes in country I's total MP relative to uh, GDP in the data and log X hat denotes the model counterpart with a group of shocks. Therefore, we may write 
the data equals the model counterpart plus an error term. The fraction of uh, cross-country variation in the MP class explain the shock, uh, that could be explained by the shock, then equals the covariance between the data and the model counterpart divided by the variance in the data. This is effectively the regression coefficient of regress in the model counterpart on the data. I compare the slope to one. A slope of one means that the shock perfectly captures the cross-country variation in the data. This measure captures shock's explanatory, explanatory power for the cross-country variation in the data and the shock's ability to propagate across borders. Furthermore, I introduced two uh, definitions. I define multinationals high color shocks to countries omega as those associated with, high color, with the high color countries in omega. For example, US high color uh, shocks include US multinationals relative productivity to local producers in all host countries that US foreign athletes are producing and US uh, as well as the US high color multinationals sourcing and selling efficiencies with all, with all, uh, with all uh, non high culture non-US countries. And similarly, the MAE host economy shocks to countries uh, in Omega Prime are those associated with the host countries in Omega uh, Prime, okay? And so here I report the results. The left panel reports the fraction of cross-country variation of changes in the column variable displayed by the row shock. And the right panel reports the, per, uh, the percentage change in broad aggregate of the column variable explained by the row shock. For example, the highlighted cell say that multinational specific shocks explain 71% of cross-country variation of changes of total MP collapse relative to GDP and reduced world aggregate MP by 5.7% relative to GDP. On the other hand, the within country shocks explain 40% of cross-country variation in uh, uh, changes of total trade relative to GDP and reduce uh, to world uh, total trade by 7% relative to uh, world GDP. And these results show that MAE specific shocks uh, explain most of the MP class. And consistent with the literature, I also find the within country shocks explain most of the, uh, the uh, trade collapse, okay? And the decline in trade and MP are related. Trade shocks and within country shocks explain a 12% and 7% of cross country variation in total MP changes in uh, relative to GDP. And more importantly, they lead to aggregate declines of total MP relative to GDP by 3.9% or 35.5% of baseline and 5.2% or 47.3% of the, of the baseline. Okay, and uh, I'm so, Harry, I just want to let you know you've got about 10 minutes left. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Just, just a quick question. So I, I was trying to remember a like, paper by Sam and Jonathan and Brent and, and uh, um, John. Um, so you have a model that's a little bit richer than their model. W where do your shocks show up differently than, than in their accounting? Um, so like they, they are basically omitting the multinational specific shocks and they are yeah, looking at the trade collapse exclusively. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like, figure out if they load on productivity or if they load on trade or where they, you right. know, yeah. the same yeah. data, you're just interpreting it differently with a different set of shocks. Exactly. Due to, due to lack of time, I do not report the results here uh, in, the, in the slide deck, but in the paper, I, I show that you know, from quantitative exercise with a model without these modern national specific frictions, um, you know, like that model approximately misallocates the impact of, you know, modern national specific shocks to local productivity shocks. And this will lead to misunderstanding of the sources of real wage changes or welfare changes for countries uh, during the Great Recession. Okay. Thanks. Excellent. And yeah, and the modern national specific shocks explain 90% of uh, cross-country variation in the trade collapse. However, they lead to increase in world aggregate trade relative to uh, world GDP. And this results uh, show that multinational, multinational sustain and even increased trade in, in the aggregate during the Great Recession. Okay, and next, next I find that within country shocks have largest explanatory, explanatory power for real wage changes, both in terms of cross-country variation and world aggregate. The local productivity shocks play an important role 
for countries' welfare um, because they, they account for the largest output share in the domestic economy. The multinational specific shocks are also very important. They contribute substantially. And it's clear from this uh, figure, within country shocks is contribute the most. I mean, specific shocks contribute a lot, but trade shocks do not um, contribute much. And next, I look at the cross-border propagation of shocks. I find ME specific shocks to the top five uh, headquarters explain 41% of cross-country variation in total MP changes relative to GDP. And ME specific shocks to top five host economies have uh, a strong explanatory power as well. In contrast, the within country shocks to the top five exporters and importers do not explain a significant fraction of cross-country variation. Um, you know, the, 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 the scatter plots show the results as straightforward from the figure that MAE specific shocks to the important headquarters and the important host economies propagate widely to other countries and generate, uh, you know, the global, um, you know, where, you know the, the collapse in MP across countries. However, the within country shocks to the important exporters and importers do not. They lead to declines in their uh, in, in, in decline in trade in, in these countries and the countries that trade a lot with them, for example, Mexico, as, uh, as, uh, as is straightforward from the figure, but not in the countries that trade less, okay? And next, I investigate the impact of these headquarter and host economy shocks on cross-country variation of real wage uh, changes. I find that I many specific shocks to important headquarters have high explanatory power than those to host countries. On the other hand, visit country shocks to important trading countries explain very little of such uh, variation. And it's more straightforward from the figure. Headquarter shocks to the five largest headquarters lead to global adjustment in real wage. On the other hand, host economy shocks to the five largest inward MP receivers lead to welfare adjustment in these countries, but very limited changes in others. And these uh, figures show that within country shocks to the five largest exporters and importers almost do not affect real wage changes in, uh, in other countries. And next, I investigate the impact of these shocks on world aggregate variables. And the countries that are hit by these shocks have large GDP shares in the world. They're, they're very large countries. Therefore, and surprisingly, um, uh, both multinational specific shocks to important headquarters and host economies as well as you know, within country shocks to important trading countries um, contribute significantly to world aggregate MP and trade decline relative to world GDP. I also find that the host economy shocks to the top five host economies contribute significantly to world aggregate um, real wage uh, changes. So to briefly summarize my uh, results, my findings, a multinational specific shocks account, account for largest share of cross-country variation and world aggregate declines of total MP relative to uh, GDP. And multinational specific shocks hitting uh, the important headquarters of MP have wide global spillovers, but those hitting the important host countries of inward MP um, also propagate to other countries because they affect other countries' outward uh, MP, right? On the other hand, EVZ country shocks account for uh, the largest share of cross-country variation and world aggregate of declines of total, total trade relative to GDP. Um, however, uh, those to the main trading countries do not propagate as strongly to the countries that trade less. Okay, so why is there the large difference between the cross-border pro, cross propagation effects of ME specific shocks and within country shocks? The intuition is the following. Countries that do not provide large amounts of outward MP may receive large amount of uh, inward MP, for example, China and India, right? Um, and they, they, they may receive you know, large amount of inward MP from important headquarters like the United States. Therefore, they are subject to the headquarter shocks to um, United States. And similarly, the, the countries that do not receive large amount of inward MP like Japan may supply a large amount of outward MP to countries like China and India. As a result, Japan is still subject to the host economy shocks to the important MP receivers. In contrast, as international trade more or less has to balance for most countries, the countries that do not ask for a lot may not import a lot either. Therefore, they are less subject to the within country shocks 
to the large exporters and, you know, and vice versa. Okay, so here I conclude. Um, in this paper, I propose a quantitative framework studying the propagation of economic shocks with multinational production, trade, and input-output uh, linkages. And I find that unlike the global trade collapse, MP collapse only happen in a few countries. To put it in plain words, trade collapse is within countries, whereas the MP collapse is between countries. I find that I many specific shocks hitting the important headquarters and host economies explain a significant fraction of cross-country variation in the MP collapse relative to GDP, whereas within country shocks to the important trading countries do not propagate globally. And within, uh, within uh, sorry, the MAE specific shocks, in particular those hit the important headquarters, explain a significant fraction of cross-country variation in real wage or welfare changes during the Great Recession. Okay, and this is the end. Thank you so much for uh, coming, coming to my talk and thanks a lot for the questions. And feel free to let me know if there are additional questions because I have like three or eight more minutes. Yeah, so that was actually perfect timing here. So that gives us a Thank few you. minutes here for a uh, for a, a couple of questions. Uh, if if people want, you know, just raise your or uh, no, don't raise your hand. Just unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, yeah, just, like just just let me know. Yeah, thanks. So uh, um, since Kim asked, I'll, I'll uh, offer a question. So so these model, uh, this is very interesting. Um, is there any way of kind of interpreting where these shocks come from? I mean, in some sense, um, you know, the model's a little bit abstract and, um, and you know, some features that might be missing from it. And you're finding that these multinational shocks are kind of big. Are they, re are they really related to policy where governments were being pretty tough on the firms or something, something about the way the multinationals operate? Is there anything we can kind of tease out from, from these, uh, from what your findings are, does it point us to something? Right. I, I think I think this is a great question. It actually relates to um, the the literature on the Great Recession. Like, what sort of variables could explain the cross country, you know, differences in the magnitude of um, of the uh, Great Recession on their output? And what I did following that literature is to regress um, the variations in the in the shocks. I, I studied multinationals' relative productive shocks as well as the sourcing and selling shocks on the pre-recession economic variables. They include the uh, bilateral investment between headquarters and the host economy, um, as well as bilateral trade and distance. I find significant results uh, for, um, for uh, the multinational relative productivity shock. This seems to suggest that enhancing bilateral investment may reduce the negative impact of the Great Recession on the multinational relative productivity shocks during the uh, Great Recession. And to enhance bilateral trade may help the same purpose um, as, as, as well. Although, you know, this is a, 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 a macroeconomic model with a value accounting approach. Um, it's definitely worth exploring this uh, with more granular uh, firm level um, data. And in terms of policy implication, I also speak to like, for example, uh, welfare um, changes. And this framework provides a, 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 a accounting framework that correctly account for the sources of uh, real wage uh, changes. And this may motivate policy as well, although I do not run direct policy uh, counterfactuals. So can I follow up on that a little bit? So that if I recall, this is a blur, it was a long time ago. There were lots of theories about what was going on in trade and, and, and uh, uh, during the, you know, the recession. Does your model help us rule out any of those theories? Like, does it, by changing the weight of how important trade is versus uh, multinational production, does it help us better understand any of those theories that were kicking around back then? Right. If I if I compare my uh, my results with the with the trade collapse uh, literature, a yeah. finding is that you know it seems, um, you know, based based on my understanding, that they overly account for the impact of uh, within country shocks on the on the trade collapse because they don't have the multinational production channel. For example, for Eaton uh, at L, they 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 find that 60 to 80 percent of the cross country variation in the decline trade is attributed to the within country shocks, whereas I show that only 40 percent uh, is related to the within country shocks with the new um, multinational production uh, channel. Um, 
I, 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 I think this is a definitely a good, good question to compare my results uh, to the literature and like due to the data limitation and this is the only like contrast I could make. Okay. Uh, but like, this is, this is a good way to go. Thanks. Yeah, I think that would be, I mean, not that you want to go on the job market telling Jonathan and Sam that they were wrong about stuff. Uh, but uh, it would be, it would be, it would be nice, uh, yeah, to give us a little more of because uh, these accounting exercises are always very useful in the sense of helping us understand where we should be digging in deeper. And so it's you know certainly uh, understanding that maybe multinational production is someplace we should be looking, we should be looking more at. It's uh, I think an interesting finding and probably, um, yeah, uh, right. probably worth worth pushing even harder on. Okay, right. Thanks. Just to follow up on that, I don't mind being found uh, wrong. <laughs> oh my God. Regresses. But Alvarez has these results in her job market paper, and I think in another paper about how much of the shock is of a multinational shock in a host country is correlated with the, with the host and how much is the home. You're doing something much more complex, but I kind of lost what's going on here with respect to that? Uh, is there a multinational shock that's being um, passed on to all of the locations where the multinational is operating or are they more subject to the local shocks? So, so like that's, I, I mean, like what, what I'm doing here is, um, you know, like using terms in the literature, the exact how algebra. So I'm checking out these multinational shocks exactly uh, from the data. Whereas what they do is to impose a structural form on the multinational's productivity as a function of the high colors productivity and host economy's productivity and some bilateral frictions and they run an um, estimation. So basically like I'm, I'm, I'm doing a different approach uh, from them and, and I'm having a, a racial model in the sense that I include both the uh, multinational and trade channels and I, you know, I, I, I study their interactions. On top of that, I, I find that the multinational specific shocks to important headquarters propagate strongly all over the world. Uh, whereas, you know, the, uh, the within country shock, important trade countries uh, do not uh, propagate um, as strongly. So I, I, I would more say like, I, I would say that my, my contribution is more, more associated with the quantitative framework and the results I derive from it. I understand there are other papers that look at performance of uh, multinationals um, in the Great Recession, and uh, I, I, I benefit a lot from uh, reading uh, these papers, but I, I think I contribute, um, I, I contribute like these new results on top of theirs. Okay, great, Harry. Well, thank you very much. If you'll go ahead and unshare uh, your screen, we'll get Armin sure. set up.